Welcome to the session on Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant, one of the most influential philosophers of modern times, is well known for the Copernican revolution that he brought about in the field of epistemology. He was born and brought up in Konigsberg and made University of Konigsberg his domain of activities at first as a, a student, then a lecturer, and finally professor. He never left the environs of Konigsberg, never married, and led an eventful life of a scholar which culminated in the publication of his monumental philosophical works, Critic of Pure Reason in 1781, Critic of Practical Reason 1788, and The Critic of Judgment in 1791, which alongside the other works form the three pillars of what is popularly known as his critical philosophy. These three critics have exerted a profound influence not only on subsequent philosophy, but rather on the entire intellectual climate of the West. The three Kantian concerns. Kant's philosophy can be characterized as an attempt to answer three fundamental questions. First, what can I know? Second, what ought I to do? And third, what may I hope for? The Copernican Revolution. The first of these questions is what he addresses in the Critic of Pure Reason. According to him, the traditional concept of knowledge rests on a fundamental mistake. Both rationalists and empiricists conceptualize mind as something active, so that having been furnished with ideas, it would proceed to inspect them and issue judgments as to what the truths they can yield. In this conceptualization of mind, a more fundamental question has been overlooked. Thus, how is knowing brought about? Or how does the mind work when it yields knowledge? Kant brings these questions back to focus, paving way to the Copernican revolution referred to before. Broadly, it consists in reversing the assumption that all knowledge must conform to objects and proposing that in order to be known, the object must conform to certain conditions set by the cognitive apparatus of the subject. What are these conditions? Transcendental aesthetics and transcendental logic. Kant lays them bare by analyzing the traditional templates of knowledge known as truths of reason and truths of facts. Truths of reason are the ones whose denial would be self-contradictory, whereas the truths of facts require confirmation by experience. Kant called the former analytic judgments and the latter synthetic judgments. Thus, analytic judgments are non a priori, that is, prior to or independent of any act of confirmation by experience, whereas synthetic judgments are non only a posteriori, that is, after some act of confirmation. For example, the proposition, all bachelors are unmarried, is analytic, whereas the proposition, 15th of August 2015, is a Saturday, is synthetic. The former does not yield any new knowledge and is simply true on the principle of non-contradiction, whereas the latter does yield knowledge and requires verification by reference. But this classification does not exhaust the realm of human knowledge and there is a per peculiar combination of these two, which in fact form the fundamental framework of the very process of knowing. According to Kant, there are some judgments which are synthetic, that is, convey some information, and yet are a priori, that is, are true without verification. Kant calls them synthetic a priori judgment, and through an analysis as to the tenability of them, he establishes the cornerstone ideas of his philosophical enterprise. The statement, every event has a cause, for Kant is a typical case of a synthetic a priori judgment. But how is this so? Now, this has a subtle connection with the way human mind works. As indicated before, though the mind plays an active role in the construction of knowledge, it's not a free and unconditioned engagement for it. Rather, there is a certain modality and conceptuality within which it should function if at all it has to. Causality is such a fundamental mode and concept of operation for the human mind. Thus, 
By way of affirming the above synthetic a priori judgment, we are simply recognizing the fact that an uncaused event would not be acceptable to the mind, rendering it unthinkable. Now, that the synthetic a priori judgments are essential prerequisites for the working of human mind, there are two fundamental concepts which lay at the base of even them. They are the concepts of time and space. All events presuppose these concepts. Space is the condition of all possible material objects and all events happen in time. Hence, these concepts are different from others and Kant designates them to be the pure forms of sensibility. They are pure because they are not dependent on any particular experience, rather are presupposed in all experience. Formal because they are unaffected by the content of experience and still they reveal themselves only through the medium of sensible experience. Kant entitles this new doctrine of space and time, transcendental aesthetics, where aesthetic simply means sense perceptible and transcendental stands for fact of time and space transcending any particular sense perception. Supplementing the transcendental aesthetics is his transcendental logic which along with the former establishes the conditions of human cognitive apparatus which we had set out for in the beginning. Just like the pure forms of sensibility, mind also has pure concepts of understanding which Kant, borrowing a term from Aristotle, calls categories of understanding. Unlike the former, they are fundamental for the assimilation of uh, sense perceptions as subjective experience. The categories include the basic concepts of first quantity, unity, plurality and totality, second quality, reality, negation and limitation, third relation in terms of inherence, causality and reciprocity and finally modality in terms of possibility or impossibility, existence or non-existence, necessity or contingency. True to the way Kant named them, they could be put in one-to-one -one correspondence with Aristotelian syllogistic statements as shown in the table. For example, the statement, all words can fly, could be subjected to an analysis with respect to the table shown. When viewed from the quantity point of view, the statement qualifies as universal, referring to unity. Similarly, it may refer to a few particular ones or a singular one qualifying itself to be referring to plurality or totality respectively and so on with the other categories as well. One must not think of pure concepts of understanding as if they were independent of all experience. They are declared to be pure not because they somehow can exist and operate by themselves but because they are present in all experience as its indispensable conditions. Kant repeatedly emphasizes that the categories are logical categories. They are the ways in which we see the world, not instruments which transform or distort the world. They are a priori but not temporarily prior. It is not the case that the mind at birth is equipped with the categories themselves with sense experience added later. The discovery of categories is a result of a logical analysis of experience. Further these categories appear to have a, a more extended application than space and time. But Kant warns us that such application will be a mistake. Many philosophers, for instance, have committed the folly of uh, using the concept of causality in talking and devising proofs about God, who, as they also claim, is neither in space nor in time. The use of categories, therefore, is to be restricted to spatio-temporal objects or appearances, whereby appearances can't means objective phenomena, accessible to and knowable by everyone under normal conditions. He terms them as phenomena, whereas the things in themselves or noumena are inaccessible to human knowledge in the sense that they don't conform to the requirements of our cognitive apparatus. Hence, they can only be thought about but not now. One is the foundational role played by pure forms of sensibility and categories of understanding is grasped properly. 
The functionality of synthetic a priori judgments in the formation of valid knowledge becomes clearer. We have already seen the case of causality. Another prime candidate is the idea of substance that has been a perennial philosophical issue. In fact, just like the idea of causality, substance is also a category of the mind. Substance is not something mysterious worth calling I know not what, like Locke did, but the power of the mind to hold together an indefinite number of properties. Transcendental unity of a perception. Having elucidated the working of the mind strictly in logical terms and having demarcated the logical powers of the mind from its psychological powers, Kant moves on to discover another mysterious entity, which is the I or the self. True to his logical rigor, Kant formulates the I or self to be the transcendental unity of a perception, whereby he means the ability to focus on our experience as unified in our own perceptions of them. It is termed transcendental to distinguish from the empirical or psychological self something that can be discovered in sensation and reflection. The self that he talks about is also strictly logical. The self that holds all the experiences together, sees them in the order of their succession, remembers the past events and anticipates the future. This self accompanies all our perceptions, which implies that the self and the world arise together. There is no self without the world and no world in the sense of organized unified structure without the self. Kant terms the activity of the mind in holding together and connecting the logical and sensory contents of experience as synthesis. This synthesis is three-faced, consisting of apprehension, reproduction and recognition. The first grasping of connections in your surroundings is apprehension. But for thinking to take place a continued reproduction of whatever is grasped is needed. And recognition is the ability to re-identify the same when it appears after some interval of time. All these are again strictly logical in terms of pure forms of sensibility and categories of understanding. Then the question remains, what about the psychological self and the so-called spiritual self or the soul? Unlike his predecessors, Kant is very ingenious on answering these questions. For him, the body and uh, the mind are a unity. And that unity is expressed in one's memory of past episodes, the grasp of the present situation, and in the anticipation and plans for the future. And in fact, this expression is facilitated by the stability of the world. Thus, every individual's experience of the psychological self is necessarily tied up with his or her experience of the world. That experience is at the base of the conviction of being an individual, with definite location in space and time, differentiated from other individuals, human and non-human, and pursuing one's own personal goals within the total structure of one's environment. Turning to the idea of soul and its attributed permanence, true to the spirit of uh, enlightenment, Kant rationalizes the whole idea by demarcating the legitimate and the illegitimate. As long as a person is alive and manifests all the characteristic capacities, permanence of human personality cannot be denied. But when he or she ceases to function as a person, that is to think, to feel, to be conscious, that is to be aware of the world, it is unintelligible and hence illegitimate to continue talking about the permanence of his or her soul. Thus, on theoretical grounds, absolute permanence or the immortality of the soul cannot be affirmed. It is at this juncture that uh, Kant ventures to answer the second and third questions mentioned in the beginning, was, what ought I to do and what I may hope for? The categorical imperative. Kant lays bare his position on morality in two key works, wise, Foundations of uh, the Metaphysics of Morals, written in 1785, and uh, The Critic of uh, Practical Reason, written in 1788. He takes for granted that the concept of something that is good without qualification is present in our conception of morality. And uh, he argues that 
that something is nothing but a good will. And a good will is present in a human rational agent if and only if the agent's reason for doing the right thing is that it is the right thing to do. But how, to, how do we know that uh, it is the right thing to do? Not every rule of action can yield a moral motive. We can determine what is willing in the right way by applying a principle that uh, Kant calls the categorical imperative. He offers several formulations of uh, this categorical imperative. The one that is most discussed is a principle of universalization, which states that I should always act in such a way that I am able at the same time to will that the maximum of my action be a universal law of nature. According to the second formulation, I should treat humanity, whether in my own person or that of anybody else, never merely as a means, but always also as an end. This implies respect for persons, but also self-respect. It rules out slavery and servility alike. A third formulation of the categorical imperative claimed by Kant to follow from the two earlier ones is that we are not only bound by the moral law, but can also regard ourselves as the authors of this law. Insofar as morality has any validity at all, we must regard ourselves as truly autonomous. This concept of autonomy, according to Kant, is coextensive with the concept of freedom. So morality requires freedom. Therefore, we must assume that we are free in so far as we are moral or rational beings. Transcendental ideas. In what has been said hitherto, we have already mentioned and made use of the ideas of God, freedom and immortality in varying contexts. But we have noticed that they don't fit neatly into the logical scheme of Kantian epistemology. Then for Kant, what do these terms signify? The essay of 1793 titled Religion Within the Limits of Reason Alone dwells upon these matters. Kant calls these ideas transcendental ideas. They do not afford any kind of uh, knowledge beyond that which is possible through space and time and the categories they can give rise only to a kind of rational faith. We have seen that freedom is a genuine concept to which theoretical reason leads us, which we can only realize in our moral experience. Furthermore, morality and freedom also give us the right to believe in the reality of other transcendental ideas, those of God and immortality. Without immortality and God, we will be condemned to moral despair. Moral action makes us deserving of happiness, but frequently does not lead to happiness in this world. If we want to establish a connection between the two, we must assume that they will be made to coincide by God in the long run. That is how the faith is rational. And the objects of uh, such faith are what one may reasonably hope for. Now let's summarize this session. Bringing about a Copernican revolution in epistemology can show that knowledge has some conditions imposed on it by the nature of mind. Mind makes nature possible in the sense that it shows us under what circumstances we may claim to possess objective knowledge about the world. The world so known consists in the phenomena and on the other side of them we have the nomina to which human knowledge has no access, but which are still thinkable. However, the nomina are accessible to us in our moral experience through our ability to act from the categorical imperative. Moral experience also allows us to postulate immortality and God's existence, but these postulates are not objects of knowledge, but merely rational faith. Based on what we have uh, discussed so far, I'd like you to do some assignments. One, prepare a chart of uh, propositions which exemplifies the Kantian scheme of correspondence between various kinds of judgments and the categories. Second, self and the world arise together. Analyze this Kantian proposition in the light of personal experience. Third, do you agree with the Kantian position on religion and morality? If yes, why? If no, what would be your alternative view? Elucidate.
I would suggest some works for further reading and uh, reference. The works of Immanuel Kant, edited by Paul Goyer and Alan W. Wood, published by Cambridge University Press in 1999. Another, Kant, a biography by Manfred Cohen, published by Cambridge University Press in 2001. The Cambridge Companion to Kant, published in 1992 by Cambridge University Press. Now some web links, ebooks.adelaide.edu and a three-minute philosophy, Immanuel Kant, available on YouTube. Immanuel Kant, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, available at plateau.stanford.edu. And Immanuel Kant, Online Library of Liberty, available at oll.libertyfund.org. Thank you for uh, watching this session. We'll meet again in another session with a newer topic. Till then, goodbye.